Good morning, everyone. This is Chris Martin with another episode of Half Hour of Heterodoxy, episode number 11. I'm here today with Norm Ornstein. He's with the American Enterprise Institute. He's the author of a number of books about, um, <clears throat> about American politics, um, about the history of the American Congress, and recent changes in Congress with an emphasis on um, gridlock and dysfunction in Congress. Uh, most recently, it's even worse than it looks, which was re-released under the name. It's even worse than it was, and he has an upcoming book, uh, which we'll talk about. It's going to be published in about a week as well. So, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Chris. Thank you. So, since we're uh, focused on education here at Heterodox Academy, I wanted to start by asking you what do you think American students coming into college should know about the American political parties? Well, I think the first. Uh, uh and core element is you hope they have a strong grounding in civics and an understanding of the Constitution uh, and a, a realization of two things about the parties. The first, of course, is that parties were not uh, in the vision of the framers. That's not what they expected. But it became very clear from the earliest moment that you needed an organizing way to uh, both have a transfer of power in government and to look at different visions of society and different policy objectives uh, and different groupings. And parties were the essential part of it. And they've been there ever since. I think it's also important for students to understand that the nature and structure of our political system and our culture makes this fundamentally a two-party system. And one of the questions that I get all the time and uh, that I think is very much on people's minds is, uh, and now especially because of the tensions within both parties, but especially on the Republican side now, uh, well, what about a, a third party? Or what about an independent party movement? And of course, uh, you've got lots of people out there moving in that direction. And some of that is this, uh, I think, uh, vision, uh, unrealistic vision of somehow, uh, and an I would say an anti-politics vision. Somehow a figure on a white horse comes riding in to save us from these horrible divisions and these evil politicians and sweeps the country. And uh, that's just not realistic given our political structure. The best that could happen, the most that could happen with an independent candidate for president is that that person would get enough electoral votes to throw the election into the House of Representatives. And with uh, three candidates, uh, the top three in electoral votes uh, potentially uh, chosen, and with the House selecting by state, so there are 50 votes, uh, the election is simply going to go to whichever party has a majority of states. And that uh, for... Excuse me. For the, for the foreseeable future, that's the Republican Party. Uh, whether you like that outcome or not, uh, that's not, I think, what people envision. And it's important simply to have a grounding and to understand, uh, and now especially because it means that there aren't outlets the way you would find in a typical parliamentary system for some of these divisions within parties uh, to uh, create some different dynamics. Right. Well, you mentioned that bromide and bromides to avoid in your last book, asking for a third political party. And I do think there's maybe some degree of envy as well for people who have not actually been to foreign countries and think that there's an element of choice, whereas in reality, in foreign countries, people form coalitions. And often you roughly have a liberal coalition and a conservative one. Yeah. Now, you mentioned civics as, as being a good foundation for understanding the parties in general. Um, but I think what civics doesn't do is tell you how the Republican Party and Democratic Party in particular have realigned, especially since the 1970s. Um, do you find that undergraduates tend to understand how they've realigned over time? No, I, I think generally speaking. And I think that's true of most Americans, um, the people who don't follow these things very closely. And even for a lot of those who do, and that includes our journalistic and pundit community, I don't think there's a deep or real understanding of the dynamic of our parties and how they've changed since the 70s, but even going back further, because 
some of the underlying changes were taking place in the 1960s. And while it's true that some of it is related to race directly, uh, we know, of course, that uh, Lyndon Johnson famously turned to one of his aides as he signed the Voting Rights Act and said, this is going to cost the Democratic Party the South for generations, that there were other larger factors as well. And one of the things we uh, point out in uh, It's Even Worse, uh, an insight that came from the late uh, great political scientist Nelson Polsby, is that where we used to have strong pockets of moderate and liberal Republicans in the Northeast and New England and the Midwest and along the West Coast, uh, when air conditioning became a common feature and it meant that the oppressive summers uh, in the South uh, could be tolerated, we had a lot of snowbirds move South. And that meant uh, often older Republicans who used to vote for those moderates moving to the South and helping to change the nature of the South. It also meant that you could get year-round factories. And so we got middle managers moving out. And the population shifts helped to make the South a bastion of the Republican Party, where it had been overwhelmingly Democratic, and helped to change the Northeast and parts of the Midwest to become more Democratic. And then other dynamics affected the West Coast, which went from being a stronghold of moderate Republicans uh, to the bluest or most democratic region in the country. And that meant a geographical and ideological sorting of the parties that really began earlier, but that accelerated as we moved through the 70s and 80s and 90s. And if you throw in the changes in mass media, the advent of tribal media, uh, and then of social media. It's also had an enormous impact on partisan identity and on whether we have a public square or share a common set of facts. And all of those things have had a major impact on our parties and on the political system. Okay. So if you were to briefly describe to a college student right now what the nature of the Democratic Party and the nature of the Republican Party are at this point in time, how would you describe it? So uh, let's uh, start with one larger uh, phenomenon that uh, Tom Mann and I pointed out uh, some years ago, which is the parties, as they have become more homogeneous and become more like parliamentary parties in a sense, have moved away from the center. But that polarization has been asymmetric. And we see this with voting scores in Congress. You also see it with some attitudinal measures out in the country. Uh, the Democratic Party, if you think of this as an a, a ideological range of worldview along uh, the traditional or uh, stereotypical football field, uh, we used to have parties when I came to Washington in the late 1960s and early 1970s, largely clustered somewhere near the midfield stripe, generally between the 40, uh, 45 yard lines, and a lot of bad mixture between the two parties. The Democratic Party's center of gravity moved away from the center and probably out to around the 25-yard line on one side, and the Republicans moved to the goalpost and then moved even further uh, to the right for a large number of its members. Uh, now, uh, though, so, you know, we used to have a Republican Party that had 25 or 30 percent of its members who were moderates or liberals. They are barely a trace element now. You had a Democratic Party that had 40 to 50 percent of its members, mostly Southerners, but not entirely, who were conservative or center, center right. Uh, that number has declined quite dramatically. They used to call them bull weevils for that insect that affects, infects cotton in the South. Then we changed to blue dogs. Those numbers have been significantly reduced. But the number of uh, ultra liberal uh, members of Congress has not gone up dramatically. Uh, so we've had that difference. Now, the Democratic Party is going through, I think, a larger struggle, but still nowhere near as acute as what we've seen on the Republican side, between its more liberal base, those who would be around the goal line, and the rest of the party that's more pragmatic and more center-left, as opposed to left-center or left-left. The Republican Party's divisions are, I think, of a different order. Uh, we've gone from having a struggle between moderates and liberals and conservatives to one among conservatives or between conservatives and more radical members. 
And I've defined that in the past in this sort of way, Chris, um, that conservatives believe that there should be a smaller government, um, but that there are parts of government that are absolutely essential and that the government we have should be leaner and leaner, but efficient and well-run. And more radical ones are skeptical of any part of government, and there's an, almost an underlying, if any part of it works well, that's bad because people will like it and they'll want more of it. Uh, there's also more of an anti-establishment, anti-leadership core among the more radical members. And to look at where the Republican Party was just in Congress, and this is metastasized out to states and around the country, uh, I came to Washington in 1969. I was a congressional fellow uh, working on the Hill. One of my fellow fellows uh, that year had come from the Defense Department, was a very conservative guy. And he didn't go back to the Defense Department. He stayed on the Hill. And he became the first executive director in 1973 of uh, the Republican Study Committee, created it. That was the right-wing caucus at the time in the House, trying to pull the Republican Party away from the center, and it had maybe 10% of the members. Today, the Republican Study Committee makes up over 80% of the members. That's the right-wing caucus, and we know now the Freedom Caucus formed because the right-wing caucus wasn't right-wing enough, and it has maybe 50 members. That's one part of the dynamic, but Donald Trump has thrown a wrench into a lot of those words. And many of those who are staunch conservatives, and even some who have been, uh, who have fit over on the radical side, are very uneasy about both Trump's approach to governing, about the kleptocracy, uh, about a movement away from a larger democracy, about a disdain for institutions, and about things like immigration. And so there are more divisions there that make it a little bit more complicated. On the Democratic side, uh, and of course, some of this has emerged because of the reaction to the uh, economic collapse in 2008 and the populism that always emerges after economic turmoil on the left and on the right. Um, and you can see, again, some of the differences in the parties. With that, we have the Tea Party movement on the right and the Occupy Wall Street movement on the left. And the Tea Party movement uh, basically is a... Uh, grassroots movement, bottom up, but they organized, they created candidates, they had an actual movement. The Occupy uh, effort occupied. They set up 10 cities across from Wall Street and, and the White House and the Fed, and then after a couple of months, they just disbanded. But the underlying sentiment was there, and that was the Bernie Sanders core support. And now we're seeing a dynamic where as the Republican Party abandoned the center, and there was an opening there, the uh, Democratic Party is facing a fierce push to move it away from the center and toward the left. And so both parties are going through this dynamic, but it's important to remember that it's still the case that there's an asymmetry here. And a good way to look at that asymmetry is simply if you ask voters, or if you look at members of Congress, or you look at state legislators, do you think that the parties should work together and compromise if that helps you to solve problems in the society? Or should you rather stand firm on your principles, even if you don't solve the problems? And Democrats and independents in the country, most Democrats in Congress, are over on the compromise side. And on the Republican side, it's much more stand firm on principle. And that's a core difference that remains between the parties. Whether that changes as you go through an era where the Republican Party is finding that it can't build support for policy success on its own members alone. Uh, now we're seeing, just as an example, uh, the uh, bipartisan effort to do something that needs to staunch the damage in the health care area in the Senate committee with uh, Lamar Alexander, the Republican chair, and Patty Murray, the uh, ranking member, uh, to work things out. Maybe we'll see pragmatically uh, some movement towards compromise. Uh, but that's the dynamic we have now. Right. And when it comes to these changes that have occurred, I think 
some congressional leaders, I think particularly Newt Gingrich, um, was influential? Or do you think it would help um, either in civics or in history to learn maybe a bit less about presidents and maybe a bit more about congressional leaders and the influence they've had on America? Uh, absolutely, I do. And I do think that if you look back at the dynamic that's brought us to this point, and, you know, I think uh, what I really wanted to emphasize uh, back with, uh, especially with it's even worse than it looks, was that uh, we had moved from partisanship to tribalism. And there's a real difference. You can be a strong partisan, but view people on the other side of the aisle as worthy adversaries. And that's partisanship. If you view people on the other side as evil and trying to destroy your way of life and the enemy, that's tribalism. And you had a lot to do with the emergence of tribalism. Now, to some degree, you could understand it. And, you know, I met Newt uh, right after he got elected in the 1978 election. Of course, he was a history professor at a tiny college in Georgia. He'd run twice before and lost, and then he won. And he came in, and uh, we had a series of uh, dinners over the first two years of the uh, 1979-80 period with members of the class of 78, Newt prominent among them. And it became clear that right from the beginning, he had a strategy and a set of tactics to go along with it to create a Republican majority in the House. And the frustration was understandable. Uh, Democrats uh, had been in the majority for 24 consecutive years at that point, And the dynamic was working to keep them there. They, they were very clever at making each election, uh, no matter how much the national tides were strong, uh, about individual members uh, separating themselves out from any of the national trends. Cummins had these advantages of money and name recognition. They got more money if they were in the majority because that meant access. And Newt needed, uh, as he saw it, to nationalize an election and to create a level of disgust in the country about uh, whoever was in charge that they would say anything would be better than this. And over the 16 years, he tribalized the political process, demonized the Congress and the political process, worked with the uh, advent of talk radio as a political entity and tribal media as they move forward, used a kind of language and tactics to divide further and to create that level of distrust. And after 16 years, when you have the sort of natural reaction against the president's party, Bill Clinton being there for two years and with Newt making sure that Republicans united to vote against everything and to delegitimize the president, he got that wave in 1994. And he brought with him a group of people who really believed that the other party was evil, that government was horrible, that he just wanted to blow the whole thing up. And some of those members who came in uh, in the classes of 90, 92, 94, that were educated along those lines and that were motivated to move in because of what he said, moved to the Senate. And we have a book, of course, called The Gingrich Senators and began to change the culture in the Senate as well. And that had, I'd say, a profound impact on our politics. If it weren't for all of that, I'm not sure where we would be in other terms, but I don't think we'd have a Donald Trump as president of the United States. Right. So when you go back to the era when Democrats were the majority, do you feel like there were things that they did, maybe abuses of power that were in any way comparable? I, I, I There absolutely were abuses of power. And, you know, what the framers believed that power corrupts um, is true. And the longer you have power and the more you come to believe that it is your God-given right to have power, the more you're going to become... Uh, uh, at least mildly corrupt in what you do. You're going to become uh, condescending towards the other side. Uh, you're going to get complacent and uh, uh, seeing things happen that aren't particularly good. And you're going to abuse the rules uh, at times. And there was a significant amount of that. Having said that, what, you, what we saw was as we moved through the 60s and into the early 70s, the Democratic Party had a struggle within itself to try and reform the process and get rid of much of the power-related corruption that was there. They didn't get rid of some of the petty corruption that comes from running the place and having your cronies there. 
Um, and they didn't get rid of all of the attitudes uh, of uh, the too powerful. Um, but they also had, in part, I think, because they'd been in charge for a long enough time, and in part because they had maybe a greater affinity towards the positive role of government, real concern for their institution and institution building and relying on expertise. And that went away, uh, all of that concern uh, with uh, this new era in the 1990s. And so there's still a difference, but uh, it would be, uh, I think, completely uh, wrong to suggest that uh, you had a pristine party against a corrupt party. Um, power corrupts. Right. So that I think is a good bridge to your new book, which is coming out this week, talking about the present and the future. So yeah. that is with Thomas Mann, whom you frequently co-author books with, and E.J. Dion. Could you talk yeah. a bit about that? Sure. So this book is titled One Nation After Trump. And the subtitle is A Guide for the Perplexed, the Disillusioned, the Desperate, and the Not Yet Deported, which covers almost everybody now. Uh, and really, there are sort of three parts to this book, I would say. The first part uh, gets to some of what we've been discussing, but it really is the roots of change in the political system that could lead to a Donald Trump, and making it pretty obvious that it's not just that Trump suddenly emerged from nowhere. There were antecedents going back decades, and he may have been propelled by uh, a revulsion against politics, uh, the uh, economic dislocations and the populism uh, emerging after 2008. But there were a lot of other elements here that led to the rise of Trump. The second part is the danger that Trump represents. And that's a danger built on autocracy and uh, the reality that you don't sort of move from democracy to autocracy in one step. It's a slow process, and sometimes you don't even know what's happening. Uh, and you can almost liken that to the proverbial frog being put in a pot of cold water that changes very, very gradually, degree by degree, and you don't realize that you're about to be boiled until it's too late. Uh, the kleptocracy, which is almost unheard of uh, in presidential behavior, um, and uh, a term that is now back in some use, but most people have, are completely unaware of it, Pakistocracy, which is government by the worst uh, among us and uh, basically very dysfunctional government. Um, but a core part of this section is an understanding that the framers built in all kinds of safeguards and checks and balances, and the civil society is supposed to provide some of those to keep us from moving in this direction. And that's in part by having vibrant, independent branches. And that starts with Congress. And if Congress is not doing its job, just to pick one example, how many hearings have we had, House and Senate, on Trump's violations of the emoluments clauses, his sweetheart deals with foreign governments, uh, is enriching himself uh, by exploiting the presidency. Zero. That's not a check and balance. We've had massive attempts uh, in many ways to push back or cover up any Russian involvement in the election. All the kinds of things that you would hope would be checks and balances and the nomination confirmation process have not been working very well. Um, and so we talk a lot about those dangers and uh, the nature of Trump's, what we say is phony populism. And uh, uh, then we move on to the more hopeful section which is where we go from here. And here, uh, I'll give you an analogy uh, that isn't in the book, uh, but uh, that really struck me a couple of weeks ago when I went to the movie Dunkirk. Um, Christopher Nolan's done quite a masterful job. In this movie. And of course, the theme is uh, the West is on the verge of uh, horrible defeat. Uh, the, almost the entire British army, 400,000 strong, are trapped on the beach at Dunkirk and are sitting ducks for the Germans. Uh, the response of the British military is tepid uh, and inadequate, uh, but British civil society uh, wakes up, is jolted, understands what this means, and responds. This immense flotilla of small boats, pleasure craft, fishing boats, and the like that saved the day. 
um, I would say there's a real chance that Trump is our donkey. Um, that we have grown complacent in a sense uh, on a couple of fronts. Uh, one is these longer term trends. And of course, much of the media coverage is, oh, it's always the same. It's not, no different than it's ever been. The two parties are the same or equivalent. And this is how politics works. Uh, but ignoring larger problems in the society that were not created by Trump, and that includes the decline of community. We've talked about that quite a lot, uh, going back to uh, the quite striking reporting of people like Robert Putnam and Bill Bishop, um, our growing uh, tribal divisions in uh, partisan terms intermixed with the party becoming an all-white party and the other becoming a coalition of minorities, race layered on top of partisanship, uh, the uh, urban, rural, suburban, exurban divisions, the movement of states to becoming uh, pure or uh, bright red and bright blue, which makes heterogeneous compromises more difficult. And now I think we've seen people awaken to the dangers for the cohesion of the society. And some civil groups, civic, uh, civil society groups, uh, religious groups, and others stepping forward to try and at least bridge some of those gaps, create some dialogue, create some level of empathy. At the same time, there's a jolt from Trump and the autocracy and kleptocracy, especially, that seem to be emerging. And we're seeing lawyers step up to the plate, uh, groups that have been involved in civic engagement. And I think one of the most heartening things, which is a very substantial group of prominent conservative and Republican policy and public intellectuals stepping up and trying to save the Republican Party from moving in a very bad direction. And that's people like uh, Bill Kristol and uh, Michael Gerson and uh, Jennifer Rubin and Evan McMullen and Max Boot uh, and Tom Nichols and the list is very substantial, George Will, uh, changing the way that the party looks at itself and not just thinking about all it's about is winning an election, but it's about your values and what you represent. And at the same time, perhaps creating a broader coalition that can reform the political process. This is as much a cultural problem as anything else, but reforms are necessary. And whether that's taking a new look at an electoral college that uh, doesn't seem to work the way the framers expected it to, uh, to looking at the uh, districting issue and redistricting, to examining the campaign finance system, to trying to make sure that we make it easier for people who are eligible to vote, not harder, uh, to making sure that there's a legitimacy fundamentally still there in our political system. Uh, and on that front, um, we've still got a lot of dangers, but we're, uh, the three of us, a little more hopeful. Okay, well, that's good to hear. So this book is a, follows up on the idea that the Republican Party has violated many norms that kept the government functioning at the national level um, and kept compromises working. So yes. I wanted to close by asking you, since you work at the American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative-leaning think tank, yeah. have you heard any interesting criticisms of that idea? Uh, you know, we're going to have a, a, a session here um, uh, on the 25th, which will be in uh, Brookings AEI uh, program. And I suspect we'll get some substantial feedback. Um, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues are not going to agree with uh, a fair amount that's in this book. But I would also say that uh, because I'm surrounded by some of the brightest conservative policy intellectuals, um, I think you'll find a, a sizable number who are very uneasy about what they've seen with the Trump presidency and the direction that they've seen uh, the Republican Party moving in. And a part of the unease is because uh, some ideas, uh, ideas that we uh, highlight in the book, in fact, in some cases, but more broadly, that could lead to uh, solving problems and bipartisan solutions that have been put forward by my colleagues in economic areas and job-related uh, policies and health policy have been largely ignored by the Republicans in Congress and uh, the Trump administration. So there's some sizable level of frustration, I think, there. And while they may not agree with every element, uh, I think uh, some parts of it will 
with your approval by a lot of my colleagues. All right. Well, I think that's a good point to wrap this up. Appreciate your Absolutely. time. Thank you again for joining us on this interview. Thanks for what you do. It's a, a great service. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.